Hi, I'm Maura Sweeney. I'm a podcaster and international speaker. But for purposes of today, I happen to be a friend of Bill De Clemente's for the interview that's to come. Bill and I met close to a decade ago when Bill was the vice president of AFIO here in the Tampa Bay area. And AFIO is the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, where he would frequently bring in various speakers from the intelligence community. Well, over the years, Bill and I have just forged a very good friendship. And Bill has an unusual background, very colorful. He grew up in New York City. I was from New Jersey. Um, he has an Italian background, as I do. And although he's a few years ahead of me, there were so many interesting crossover points that I just loved getting together with Bill, hearing some of his stories about life. And I was delighted to find out he was putting a lot of those stories into today's interview. So I hope you relax, enjoy yourself. You'll hear uh, interesting details, not only about the Bill's background as the original inspiration for the Karate Kid, but also of his time in the military, uh, doing some clandestine work. You'll meet some characters that are both famous as well as infamous. I hope you have a great time hearing these stories, even as I have too. Thanks a lot. Bill, let's talk about your family. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Well, my mother was born in Catania, Sicily. My father was born in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. His family, his mother and father, came from Reggio, Calabria. Uh, I took them for granted. I thought everybody came from a family like I had. It wasn't until years later that I learned just how lucky I was. I never heard my mother and father have an argument or even raise their voice to each other. And as years went on, and I went to two, two marriages, and I learned what a difference and dysfunctional families people come from. So I feel sad to say that I took them for granted and uh, really appreciate them now. I was pretty fortunate. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. Dad worked. He provided well. We lived in a nice neighborhood, Richmond Hill, Queens, north by Forest Park. Uh, nothing fancy. It was just, uh, like I said, I was blessed with a great family. Thank God. T tell me about your house. Well, the best years of my house, of my life, we lived in three different homes. I was born at on 104th Street, and then we moved up to 85th Avenue. And 85th Avenue, I had the greatest years of my life because there was a schoolyard six houses down from the corner where I was. And if I was in there doing homework, I could hear guys playing ball. Of course, my mind always went to the schoolyard and playing ball. I didn't like schoolwork. I wasn't a good student. And we would go there and we would play ball, stick ball, basketball. We didn't play full court, we played half court. And uh, handball. And it was just, uh, we played and played. We never got tired. We were young. Today kids play with video games and they don't get off the couch. We were always playing ball. And if I wasn't playing ball, I was lifting weights. I even built it a custom-made gym in my basement. I didn't have the money to go out and buy all the equipment I wanted. So I got two by fours and a saw and did it the old way. My father showed me how to bolt things together and groove out the things like for the, for the uh, barbell, you could slip it in so it wouldn't roll off, make grooves and back supports, chin bar. We actually drilled a hole through the four by eights, the two by eights in the basement and slipped a pipe through, so there was no way in the world it could have a slip through. And uh, they were crude with their work. And I loved working out. Uh, I went to Holy Child, which was a Catholic grammar school. All the little angels went there. And uh, great years. 
We learned from the nuns. That was like a reform school in those days. Uh, it was it was interesting. It was fun. And then I went to St. John's Prep in Brooklyn for one year. It was too much transportation, taking the train there, and you'd lose an hour in the morning going to school, an hour coming home. So I transferred into Richmond High School. And uh, then, of course, I was like always into fitness and working out. Uh, it's hard for me to say this without sounding braggadocious, but I was very fit. And pe most people are young, they say, oh, I was in good shape. I was in very good shape. In 1962-01, fourth place in the country in the first ever national fitness, fit, fitness uh, competition sponsored by the U.S. Marine Corps. I had the highest pre-qualifying scores going into testing, but it was at a higher altitude when we tested, and I got a little hyperventilated on the 300-yard dash at the end. So I only came in fourth, but that was something to be proud of. I think the uh, trophy's still in the high school display case. Uh, that's about it. As far as my schooling, I wasn't much of a student. I went for, to college for one year, Murray State University in Kentucky. The reason I went there, there was an Italian gym teacher, Bazzario, Larry Bazzario, that was a big football star there. And my mother went to talk to him. He had connections, and he got me in. But then again, one year, I just wanted to be home. I was too young. I started college at 16. I turned 16 in college. Yeah, because my birthday was in September. But uh, there, it was uh, it was interesting, and it was fun. I have, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of a lot of things. A lot of life experiences that people just don't get today. I had the privilege and honor of meeting a lot of different people. A lot of people. Bill, think back to your mom and dad and tell me your favorite memories or your favorite thing about your dad and your favorite thing about your mom. Something that just sticks with you. Well, my father and mother would be sitting next to each other, and throughout my life, uh, there were many situations that I came out, just things that happened that were, like, overwhelming. And my father would be sitting next to my mother. She'd be on his right side, and they'd be in front of me, and he would have, and I'll do his expression exactly. Sheesh. I told you, Mary, this kid was born with a horseshoe up his ass. Because I used to come up and come out small like a rose on a lot of different situations, and it was something that was funny. Friends of mine that really knew us well could relate to that because they heard him say it, and his mannerism, that was kind of funny. And what about your mom? What, what do you remember? Uh, just a good person. A, a good woman. I was very blessed. She didn't look to go shopping for herself. Everything was for me and my sister. I had a sister, Violet. She was uh, 45 years of age, but she passed away, unfortunately. And she was the good kid. I was the problem. You know, it's funny how they usually love the one that gives them the most problems. He usually works that way. Tell me about Jimmy Fitzgerald. Jimmy Fitzgerald was a real-life, walking, talking Jimmy Cagney. He was the toughest guy in the neighborhood before he ever learned karate. And uh, I always looked up to him. I always looked up to the tough guy. He said the big shots. And they kind of liked that. And Jimmy always took me under his wing. Wing guy was his favorite. But he was a character, and sometimes he'd pass the schoolyard driving his Bonneville convertible with the top down and his arm hanging out the window with his muscles showing. You know, he was a character. When you see his pictures, you'll realize he, you could see he was a tough-looking character. Uh, one day I was in the schoolyard, and one of the guys come, comes in to play ball with his usual suspects. And he says, hey, did you hear Jimmy Fitzgerald open the karate school? That's all I had to hear. Jimmy up there, where? Jamaica Avenue or Wood Haven, right on the other side of Wood Haven Boulevard. Well, I ran all the way down. 
I get there, first time I ever saw anybody in a white gi, black belt, and uh, of course, karate was a very rare commodity in those days. I mean, it isn't like today. Today, you just take Taekwondo and everything, and everybody's got a black belt, little kids running around, fifth degree. It's marketing. Today, they're unlicensed babysitting services. It's a little bit of an embarrassment. But uh, they didn't even teach kids in those days. Uh, anyway, I went by there, and I was overwhelmed, and I went home, and I told my mom and father at dinner, at dinner, Jimmy Fitzgerald opened a karate school pop. It's only $15 a month. Let me join it. I'll bake them. No, nah, no. Nah. Come on, Pop. Well, after a couple of weeks of me begging them, my father says, uh, I'm going to go down to the karate school. And he wouldn't let me call him. Well, he came home, and he's telling me, it's okay. I spoke to Jimmy. You can join. And he gave me my first $15 payment. They didn't have contracts in those days. You went there, you paid every month. And... I would be there at night, five nights a week, sometimes on Saturdays. We trained. We didn't have air conditioning in those days. I mean, we were ranging wet. We'd catch a second wind in the track and field. They would call it uh, breaking the, uh, is it a technical word they use for it, when you catch a second wind. And... Uh, it's just after that, you can take on the whole neighborhood. I mean, there's no stopping you. You never get, you never run out of gas. Fighters do that too. It usually takes about three rounds and then they, they break through that barrier. Break through the wall. Anyway, uh, I found out. My, see, my father didn't want me to take karate. Because they thought karate was like fighting. They didn't want me involved in being a boxer or a fighter or anything like that. So he went down and talked to Jimmy, and Jimmy explained to him it's not fighting, it's self-defense. It's an art of self-defense. He's not going to be fighting. We don't even compete in tournaments, and we didn't. Shoru did not compete in tournaments. Tournaments became a money-making source for karate schools. Ansi Mushiro, who brought the Matsubayashi branch of Shoru to this country. Uh, you'll see pictures of him and Jimmy together. Uh, they didn't believe in tournaments. Real fights are not games. There's no pulling punches. There's no throwing ridiculous kicks. Some people are strong. Some people can take a shot. It's doing things by reflex reaction, and I coined the phrase being sneaky fast. Uh, to defend yourself, life limb of someone you love. Uh, you're not there to be a nice guy or a sportsman. And if a guy's a foot taller than you and a hundred pounds heavier, you can't say, I can't fight you because you're bigger me. You have to use your mind, which is the greatest weapon we have, to be deceptive, sneaky, fast, and take him out of the picture right away. It's not a sport you act. Well, anyway, uh, I went down and uh, Jimmy had a good talk with Pop and Pop with Jimmy. He said to me, it's okay, you can join and I always looked up to Jimmy. And I was like his favorite. One day, I see him waiting for a bus on a corner of Woody Boulevard, Jamaica Avenue. I was only a brown belt at the time. In those days, it took three years if you were in tremendous shape just to get a black belt. They didn't give them out like uh, they didn't have every color in a rainbow. It was yellow, green, brown, black. And uh, he said, where are you going? He says, I'm working on going on score tonight. A score? Take me with you, man. No, no, I can't. Jimmy, come on, man. I want to go with you. I want to do it. He says, no, nah, I can't. Go. I promised your father that you'd stay on the street. No, your father knows my reputation. And I gave him our word. I only couldn't say anything about that. Jimmy was right, and I, I had to admire him again for being a character that kept his word. Well, that night had a big effect on my life. Because the next day, the newspaper headlines read, Fourth of July Murders. Now, in New York, to make the cover of the newspaper, that's to be pretty sensational. Jimmy went on a score 
with two other guys, and they were in a house in Ozone Park cooked up the night. I don't know. No one knows what happened for sure. Jimmy and the girl were killed. I don't know if they did it at a greed so they didn't have to cut up more money. I don't know. But I was really shaken up to lose a friend that I looked up to to be murdered like that. Uh, his mother moved to California after that. His brother Frankie is in Atlanta. I'd been in touch with him. His sister uh, Catherine is in Laughlin, Nevada. I'd seen her when I was out there visiting. And the other city, a sister, Eileen, she's in Vegas. I hope they're well. I haven't been in touch for a while. So that was it. I never went back to the cry school again. I started teaching friends of mine in my basement in Queens. And then a lot of the guys came from Red Hook, Carroll Street, President Street, around the Union Street. So to make it easier for them, we started to use my grandparents' house in Bassard's Brooklyn on 55 Bay 20th Street. It was a halfway point. So the guys would come from Queens, and we'd all lead over there and train in the basement. Be about 20, 25 feet long. And like I said, we were all young, tough guys. This is no wimpy coop in there. <laughs> they were all characters. And we train, and after we got done, we were all getting our cars in our geese, and we'd go down to the Cropsey Avenue Bridge, which was very close, and shoot the back way into Coney Island, stop in Nathan's. Now, we shouldn't have done this, but we did. We weren't waiting our life. We just paraded up to the front. 20 young, well built guys in shape, in white, in karate uniforms. Nobody's going to say, who told us? We got, we got served right away. But we did that on a bunch of occasions. And uh, very interesting. But uh, I'll get into the Columbia Pictures case later with the Karate Kid, the name, etc. By the way, it was Jimmy Fitzgerald that gave me the nickname the Karate Kid. It started as a nickname. Then it becomes what is known as a common law mark. And when it's used in interstate commerce, you, it qualifies for a patent and trademark. And I own the trademark. It was granted to me. I'll, I'll get into all the technical stuff on that. And things. At the World's Fair, my friend Pete and I went to the World's Fair in Flushing, Queens. At the World's Fair, we went to the, one of the restaurants, very big, of course, it's huge, and there was a little confrontation going on, and some guys were picking on this other guy, and me and Pete went to his aid. Uh, that guy told us he was on his way to a karate exhibition. I didn't even know about it. Eddie McGrath and Don Nagel, issue little guys. So we went with him. That guy was Robert Mark came and wrote the movie, The Cry Kid. We all came from Queens. Eddie McGrath, Robert Law came, and myself. We probably lived within, within a 10-mile radius. There was no accent. Uh, he came to watch me teach. I was teaching as a brown belt. Uh, he watched Eva went with us on a couple of weekends. I think two times, but the guys did not like her. He was like an arrogant little guy. Nobody wanted him. Even Tully Calabro, one of my first black belts, said to me, Bill, get this guy out of here. Nobody likes this guy. Nobody even wants this guy around. I said, look, let's give him, a, give him a shot, see what it's like. He wound up training with Eddie McGrath, who gave him his black belt. Eddie McGrath was older, much more proficient than I, so it was a good choice. Uh, Eddie took the stand for me twice, sort of. Columbia Pictures case. He was acknowledged by Kingman as the inspiration for the tough ex-Marine in the movie. And by the way, we didn't have air conditioning on our hot summer nights. Sometimes the guys from Brooklyn, we'd say, let's meet along Palm Beach, which was around the Belt Parkway, and we'd train along the water, just like you see in the movie. And we used to go down, uh, like date night, on Saturday night, we'd go down to Rockway Playland, which was the amusement park kind of depicted in it. Now, it wasn't... A biography, but there was so many likenesses. Even my appearance, as you'll show, when I was yelling, looked just like Ralph Macchio. And by the way, the writer, the movie, didn't use 
a casting agent to pick out the Daniel LaRusso character, which happens to be a young Italian guy that looked just like me. You'll see the likeness in, in the pictures that will be dropped in editing. So there was a lot to that. A lot to it. But uh, great memories. Great memories. And in karate, you meet a lot of people that become lifelong friends. And when you're young, you don't realize it. But who's going to be a lawyer? Who's going to be a big-time businessman? One of the guys, Anthony Conti, the two Conti brothers, Tommy and Anthony, from uh, Union of Sackett Street, right you know, went on to, when we got together many years later, he told me he was in retail. Retail? What kind of retail? It was a humble way of saying that he was a big businessman. He owned B. Altman and Company. He owned 49% of it. The other 51% was owned by the Gucci's. So we're talking a major businessman here. He buys acquisitions and things. Became very successful. Uh, then, military. I got drafted. And of all the friends I know, I'm the only one that got drafted. No one else. What year is this? 1965. And, uh, we went to Whitehall Street. And from Whitehall Street, that was a big station used to transport troops to World War II. And, of course, there were so many thousands of us being rushed through. It in 65, somebody had really started heating up. Got, things got serious over there. And they had a special train take us. And that train took us all the way down to Fort Gordon, South Carolina, where we did basic. And then... MP school in Fort Benning, Georgia. And then jungle training at Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And an interesting thing happened then. Most military bases, I didn't know that then, I learned it later on, have areas, almost all of them, called black sites, spots that don't exist. I was taken aside to, at a black site military does not even know this is going on. No one knows. These are very secretive operations. And I was offered an opportunity to work what they call it as a test asset for the company, the CIA. And I didn't even know the name of it at that time. It was all arranged. It was explained to me what would happen, this and that, and uh, you can't tell anybody. If you're married, you can tell your wife. If you're not married and you have a mother and or father, you can tell your mother and father. Other than that, it has to be totally secretive. So I says, can I give you an answer tomorrow? They says, yes, by all means. They said, I'd like to speak to my little father about it. And I remember making the phone call. And I called mom and said, in those days, we'd have cell phones. She'd pick up the phone that she told my father, Bill, pick up. And my father picked up. And I told, listen, I need your advice on something. I says, uh, I've been offered a special operation, and I will not have to go to Vietnam. It's domestic. So my father said, what's the operation? I says, it's something for the CIA. I don't have all the details yet. They'll brief me but I will be able to communicate with you because I will be doing this in a location where I just can't make phone calls, but I will get your messages as much as I can. Maybe once a month they'll let me get to a phone when the right people are there. So that's what do you think I should do. And I kind of choke up when I think about this because I remember my father saying, I lost my brother in World War II. I don't want to take a chance and lose my son in Vietnam. Take the deal. Wow. Our granted is in the World War II memorial that Lee Iacocca put together. And uh, my family paid their dues. My mother came over to Ellis Island. I got her in the, the Ellis Island, Island Foundation. You will be showing those documents in uh, 
the editing when you drop the pictures in. So that was a very interesting thing. And it was very well planned out. Uh, I only found out it was declassified in 2010 because I was plaintiff on a lawsuit and some guy that thought he was Charlie Chan's son half-assed cop from Yonkers, New York, which is not for... It's a little... It's not part of NYPD. It's a little municipality, but I'm precinct it. Not drunken cops. And I'm more of a guy. You can have cops. I don't dislike cops, but this guy was... In his deposition, he came out dirty. He was a mailman arrested for stealing mail. Had it aspired. Got on the police force in Yonkers. He couldn't make any rooms. Must have lied to the application, which is a very serious federal problem. Uh, and... He was charged with homicide when he was a cop. They paid the family off for that. The guy hung himself in the holding cell, breaking a handcuffed suspect's eye socket. They paid the family off for that. Drunken, disorderly, Daytona Beach, which was not a big deal. And two, uh, stealing all the time. The guy was a low life. But he thought he was cool. And he sent away for the Freedom of Information Act, and they came up with this document and it showed military it showed Fort Gordon Fort Benning military police national service uh, national service uh, award I forgot the exact title of it I have a copy of it and uh, there was a lot in the middle there's a thing that says details and it says unavailable of course, it's classified, but this Charlie Chan that he thought he was couldn't figure that out. So I had to check to see if it was declassified because I couldn't even talk about it, and it is. It was declassified in 2010. I worked what became known, and it was the first ever domestic CIA operation, 1966, Operation Nation of Islam. And uh, I can't talk about sources, uh, source, sources and methods, but it was really cool. And the way they did it, they brought me back to Fort Benning in a little private plane with a handler and a pilot, my handler and pilot. And I had been an MP at Fort Benning. Fort Benning is a very interesting place. There was a lot going on there. The University of the Americas, the shore of Iran went to college there. It was pretty... Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Well, I looked down in those private planes, those little planes, you know, two engines, four passengers. The cars on the ground are going faster than the old. And we get there, it wasn't too far away, a couple of hours, three hours. And I look down, and as they're circling the airfield, I see police cars, military police cars, circling the whole perimeter. I said, this shit. I was an MP, I ended up sorting like that. Well, the plane goes down, we get there, I get off. They put handcuffs on me, you can't be handcuffed in the plane. And the provost marshal knew me because I ain't been an MP here. He walks over and says, oh, our man, I'm sorry to see this is you. We had, we had been notified to have everybody get live ammunition that were bringing in some badass. Well, I tried not to laugh. But they wanted me to look like they were bringing Dillinger in, and there was a reason for it. They gave us an escort, police cars, all the way to the prison. There was a lot of black Muslims that were claiming to be conscientious objectors. And they needed me to get certain info to them. Not my opinion, info. And... In those days, they didn't have computers. They wanted me to be what they call a flight risk and dangerous. I wasn't allowed out of the building, even for on a nice day if they were doing a head count outside. I was allowed outside. I had to be inside. So they had to get me a job inside to keep me busy. And uh, I got a job as a, a clerk, filing clerk, clerk. Everybody that comes in and out of a prison has to go for a physical exam. And 
a psychiatric concern. Now, I can't be in the room when the doctors are examining or the psychiatrists are talking. But in those days, they didn't use computers. They wrote hand notes and records and this and that. And I would be the filing clerk that would be in there when the doctor was, wasn't working and didn't fight. Well, use your imagination. I breathed up a lot of cartridges on the Xerox machines. And of course, uh, the stuff went out to another asset that was in there, a god, and it went to the CIA analysts. You know, I was just a spoke in a very big wheel, but uh, I was proud of it. And uh, interesting enough, it was, uh, if you Google it, probably come up, put in the CIA 1966 domestic operation and was authorized by President Johnson. Operation Nation of Islam. Now, since then, I know they changed the name twice. It made me more sense. So I asked my contacts because I had worked a couple of test asset situations after that. And uh, they, I says, how come they do that? They said they do that and they change the names to make it difficult for anybody under the Freedom of Information Act to find it. They keep changing the titles. It's pretty it's pretty crafty. You know. So I was part of that. And uh then I was tasked on a couple of other things. I had a lot of contacts. Don't forget I owned a gym in Miami later on, years later. Uh and it was very few gyms then, too. So people would come from quite a distance, and Miami had a lot of people. A lot of people. There was one guy that used to come. Sturgis. Ralph Sturgis? Frank Sturgis? Frank Sturgis. That's not his real name. He's an Italian guy. M M Manero or something like that. Something like, I forgot it now. But he came. And there was a lot of guys that used to come in. You know, they don't, they don't advertise who they are. If they were undercover, they never. But he was involved with the Bay of Pigs. He was involved with Operation 40. Uh, he did time on the Watergate. He served time with that. My friend Andy Garofalo, one of my early black belts, served time with him. Frank Sturgis. Yeah. Uh, there was a bunch of other people there to it. I think he passed. I don't like to talk about people that are alive. You know, not when they did uh, clandestine operations and stuff like that. The Bay of Pigs, she was involved with that before I learned. Uh, like I said, I, I met a lot of people, a lot of people. Uh, I had health clubs in Brooklyn, in Manhattan, Jersey, and in Florida. Now, I wasn't a big businessman. I operate one owner operator one at a time. And uh, when they're making money, they all did. You could flip it. Because some business that has a track record and taxes there to show you're making money. Everybody wants to buy into a business that's especially if a guy has money, doctor or lawyer, he's got a son that doesn't know where he's going in life, he likes to work out state, buy him a gym and take it from there. So I would sell it, take a couple of years off and open another one, you know, those are the kind of things that I did. And you meet a lot of interesting people. I had Mr. of America's come to my place, Mr. Universe in Brooklyn. I have pictures of them that don't drop in at anything. Um, when I had the, uh, well, I had the Manhattan ones. I learned the business. The guy that taught me the health club business Howie Joseph owned the Shelton Health Club for women. That's that's like, you know, in those days, a guy, a young guy, managing a health club for women in Manhattan. They were rare. It was right across from the Waldorf Astoria on the Lexington Avenue side. Famous people, Ali McGraw, Cindy Crawford, uh, jo Johnny Carson's first wife, Joanna, David Susker, one after that, I can't even remember them all, famous models, and well, they all came to work out at the club. I learned the business, and then eventually opened up my own. Uh, we opened one 
in Manhattan downtown called Spa Trek. Like Star Trek, Spa Trek. Now downtown, at night it's desolated. There's no one there. Matter of fact, I had a new caddy and I used to park it in the parking lots because you can't leave cars on the street down there. And then at 6 o'clock at night, I'd run over there, put it up in front of the building. And uh, that's the way I would leave it. It just so happens there was a, I guess you would call it, what we would call it, I don't know what they call it today, a strip club, right? Next door downstairs. So here's a new Cadillac parked in front of this place at night and drew the attention of a woman who was watching that club. I didn't know it, but the guy was a suspected drug dealer. Must have been pretty big time beyond that club. And uh, I got pulled over one night, searched the car and this and that, because they must have thought I had something to do with them, which I didn't, of course. But uh, then there was another one, the Park, P-A-R-C, Hell Club. That was a spa. I had a partner, Joe Novelli, on. He wasn't much into the business, but we weren't partners on it because it was an expensive deal. The Park Hell Club was in the Park Vendome, which is an old, pretty well-known condominium there on 57th Street. And it had a back entrance on 56th, and that's where the entrance to the Hell Club was. Swimming pools, steam rooms, all the girls that were the ballet dancers. Uh, what's that... Um, where did all the ballet dancers train and perform over there uh, in Manhattan? I can't remember now. But they used to be in the pool doing exercises with floats on their ankles and all to stretch and all. It was, uh... Anyway, Joe bought a house out in Long Island. So he says to me, Bill, you haven't seen the new house I bought on the island. I'm working Sunday. Why don't you shoot in from Brooklyn? Follow me out. We close early Sunday. Have dinner at the house. We'll sit around, we'll talk, and you'll see the house at the same time. All right, Joe. So I shoot into Brooklyn, into Manhattan, which was nothing going in. Coming out, I should have realized it's summertime, beach traffic, New York. And if you don't know what New York traffic is, it's a parking lot. Especially beach time going anywhere out on out up to the beaches, Johnson's Beach, etc. So we're going out bumper to bumper on the southern state. So Joe singles me, and we take a connecting road to the um, northern state parkway. Try that. Bumper to bumper there. A nightmare. And we're going finally. Joe signals me again, and we go up to the Long Island Expressway. Try that. Well, it has a nickname, the Long Island Distressway. Another nightmare. We're on it for hours. Finally, Joe figures, let's take the middle of the road, let's go back to Northern State. We get on it, and we're going along. And we're gone. And I'm talking about maybe a half an hour between exits. I mean, it's bumper to bumper. And on the right-hand side is this big, grassy hill. I mean, high way up there, long. So I say to myself, now Joe and I had bought two brand new Cadillacs, 1972 Cadillac Coupe de Ville's. That was the car in those days. They didn't have BMWs and Porsches started running around. The old Cadillac was de -carred. So I know that every road, every highway has a service road. So I said, you know what? We go up the hill, get on the service road, we beat on this path. I took the horn signal, Joe. I start going up the hill. He cuts off the parkway, and we're climbing up this hill. We're not going straight up. We're going on an angle. This was sharp. This thing might have been 300, 400 yards. And all these people must have been watching us. Seeing the those maniacs with the little Cadillac going up the hill like that. It's tilting. It's sharp. You know, and you feel you're not going to roll over, but you feel like you could. We're going up, 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 and then, oh, no. Chain link fence running along the whole thing. Six foot chain link fence, I saw. Well, oh, here we go. I got to go back down the hill into all those people that are going to be laughing their ass off watching us climb up there. 
and we're going down, and I'm saying, oh, man, this is embarrassing. And in New York, the drivers are the most courteous. When you get down there, you've got to hope one is nice enough to let you get in. Well, finally, we get in, and we're going. Now, we're going another hour. And it's grassy hill again. So I says, that fence can still be right up there. We've gone miles. Maybe we went 20 miles. So I single him, and we're going off again. We go off the highway, up the hill, making our own road all the way out. We get to the top. Oh, no. Chain link fence. Still running. Six foot chain link fence with aluminum posts and the whole bit. There's no way I'm going back down that hill. I can't face that crowd again. They must be laughing like hell. So I let it jaw off. And in those days, we had bumpers on our cars. So I slowly roll up, touch my bumper to the fence. Joe gets to the, my side. He does the same. We look at each other, and we're smiling. And very slowly, we roll, and we see the fence going down. Now, the fence doesn't just go down there. It spreads. You have uh, aluminum posts every so many feet to support the fence. And the fence is going down, 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 and down. It gets flat. We very slowly roll right over it. And we're smiling. I get on the service road. I couldn't have went 50 feet. And all of a sudden, oh, I, ran it. I pull off. Cop walks up to me. He says, I can't believe it. I've been on the job 25 years. I never saw anybody do that. I never saw anybody make their old exit right through a fence. I can't wait to get back to the precinct and call the guys. He actually was laughing. And she's thinking you see me over there eating lunch under the tree. I says, no, I wouldn't have done it if I would see me there. And anyway, the two of us were kind of laughing. He was he was amused by the whole thing, thank God, because technically they could have arrested us and made us pay restitution, but fixing that fence, we laid down a lot of fence. Probably laid down 150 feet of fence flat with it. Chain link. Anyway, uh, I thought that would... You can't make this stuff up. I mean, this was it was funny stuff. We got a ticket for going through the fence. It was a $150 fine. I didn't even have to make a court appearance. I mailed it in. Whew, thank God. And that's it. Uh, that was a funny moment. Wow. When I was 18, I had never met anybody famous. And... Uh, my father always said, whenever you go to New York, whatever we call Manhattan, New York, we even call Brooklyn the Queens, even though it's what the five boroughs, New York, we Manhattan. Always wear a suit or a jacket because people dressed in those days. And if you weren't dressed, you looked like a derelict, so to speak. Well, I was 18 and I drove to New York. I parked and I'm walking around on 57th Street, north side of the street, heading east. And I'm stopped standing there waiting for the traffic and the light to change with the 20, 30 other people waiting on this side and 20, 30 on the other side. You know, it's it's been at. And I look across the street and I'm, I said, holy cats, it looks like him. And I'm looking and looking. He moves, he has two friends with him. And I said, Holy God, that's him. I was so excited. I, we're crossing the street, and we made eye contact with each other. I don't know what made me do this. I just had to do something. And he's looking at me, and I looked at him, and I says, Ha-cha-cha-cha. And he looks at me and says, How you doing, kid? How you doing? Well, I was obviously the legendary Jimmy Durante. I couldn't wait to get home and tell Pop. I mean, I wish that I could say I met him. I didn't meet him. We crossed paths, and we had that, what I think is a very cute exchange. 
and I never forgot. It was the first important celebrity I ever crossed paths with, and it was quite an honor and something that I wanted to share with the, the viewers. Another actor that I became very friendly with, we're still in touch today, he lives in Beverly Hills, is Barry Newman. Barry Newman in those days had his own TV show called Petrocelli, where he played a private eye out in the desert out in Arizona. Uh, he has a lot of accomplishments. He won a Best Supporting Actor Academy Award once. I think it was the movie The Lawyer, opposite Paul Newman. Uh, Barry and I became good friends, and he used to come to the Park Health Club. And he used to like to jog. And we had to go down by the West Side Highway, which was through Hell's Kitchen there. So he liked company when he walked down. It wasn't a great neighborhood. And I'd walk down. He'd jog. I'd play handball a little bit by myself, volleying. And uh, he'd come back. We'd walk back to the, to the gym and he'd get me a break to get out. And... Uh, Very interesting. In those days, they used to wear a shoe called Cuban heels. You're too young to remember that, but that was the style. And Barry says to me, you know, this old guy that comes to the gym, he thinks he can play handball. He says, you could play it for 100 a game. These guys are real sucker. I'm going to sell them. Yeah, okay. There was another guy that was a big political heavyweight, Ben Baba Gallo, that used to come in. So they arranged for me to play this guy, Arnie. Arnie Zuckerman. Physically, he didn't look like he was eight. Well, we go down to play, and Barry says to me, you could beat this guy wearing your cubic heels. In other words, you don't even need sneakers with this guy, right? But don't worry, I had sneakers we get there, and Arnie, Ben Barber Gallo and Arnie are on the side. Arnie says, you know the volley wall? I said, okay. So I hit it. He hits it. I hit it. I hit it. We're going back and forth. I'm saying, man, I'm playing pretty good. I felt good. I didn't realize he was so good. He was putting the ball in my hand just to be nice as a volley. He said, all right. You can serve. If I get up there, I serve. Oh, the ball is returned. It does not even bounce. It's what they call a kill shot. It hits the lowest part of the wall and rolls out. You can't return. It's a killer. I pick the ball up, throw Donnie, get back there, and wait for him. He serves it. Serves it right to me. I slam it. He hits kills it again. Ball hits the wall. Rolls out. There's no way you could even make a play on it. I take it. I throw it to him. He does it. Same thing again. I take the ball. I throw it to him. Get my position. I'm waiting. He serves. And he doesn't try to take me out on the serve. He lets me hit it. He's giving it to me. And I slam it. Trying everything. Everyone was a kill shot. Everyone. It was 11 nothing. I put my hands on my thighs and I pivot towards Barry and Ben Babagal. They were holding their mouths hysterical, trying not to laugh. When they saw me look at them, they cracked up. Little did I know, but the guy I was playing, we became very good friends, partners in businesses and everything. Arnie Zuckerman was one of the greatest handball players in the world. He only lost in national championships to the guy that was Tyson's manager, the world champion, uh, Jimmy Jacobs. That was the guy, only guy he ever was to. The guy was so good, he could put the ball anywhere, and he didn't try to wipe me out. He wouldn't even take the hundred bucks from me. 
But it was a, it was a Kodak moment. I mean, did they set me up? And I'm trying to look cool. Ten nothing, eleven, eleven nothing. Now I just something's not right here. I mean, nobody could be that lucky, and they were cracked up. They never forget it. Barry still laughs when we talk about it. Remember when you set me up with Arnie Zuckerman? That was priceless. And by the way, Arnie Zuckerman's sister was Ben Goodman's manager for 28 years. Muriel Zuckerman, Benny Goodman's manager. Like I said, I you meet so many people through health clubs and karate schools, and but karate schools, of course, you were much younger at the time. But then I taught, and uh, I, you know, most of the karate schools had an attached place, and I had some. I even got a trademark for the Karate Kid Training Centers, and I started using that. You'll, you'll be dropping those pictures in and editing, showing them. In Jersey, I had them. But that was the only thing I really didn't make any money teaching karate. You can't make money unless you're a babysitter. And I, I wasn't into teaching the kids. The kids can't learn. You can't teach a kid to fly a plane. You can't teach a kid real karate. Oh, that was interesting. But only took him in Ben Bob and Uh Oh, Barry and I was a drizzly, drizzly day, and we're walking on 57th Street. I get a call the next morning. Now, when it's raining, my hair would flatten out, and, you know, I'm, my figure was a lot thinner than the course. And next morning, Barry calls me. Did you see the paper today? I said, no, why? What happened? Go get the paper. What happened? Go get the paper. Call me back. I go get the daily news, because that's to come out in the morning and at night. And there's a picture of me and Barry Norman walking on 57th Street. The caption underneath says, Barry Newman, Petrocelli, and Robert Blake, Beretta, walking on 57th Street. They, some paparazzi thought I was Robert Blake with him. So we really got quite a laugh at it. I wish I still had that clipping. I have many newspaper clippings, as you'll be dropping in on editing. The press had always been very kind to me. A lot of uh, cover stories and Miami Herald, Boca News, uh, Hollywood Entertainer, Hollywood's... Uh, Yeah, Hollywood Press, the Palm Beach Post, Asbury Park Press in Jersey. Uh, the press was pretty kind to me, always kind to me. And you hold your breath when you give them a story because the reporter would come to you and a photographer would come to you and they're snapping pictures as you're talking and this and that. And the reporter does not put the title or caption on the story. The editor does that. Today, they would call it clipbait, but they try to get your attention. So I had in Boca, a guy came to my apartment in the prestigious Mize in the park, and he says, the door opens at this and that, and he's describing it, and the guy wanted me to demonstrate something. I says, it's going to be hard to do something. I'll, I'll throw a punch, but the shutter speed in the camera, it's, it's got, got, he won't be able to capture it. He's, no, he's got a high-speed shot. He'll get it. All right. So I throw oh, I'm still acting fast, even now. That's good I to see. I believe in being sneaky fast. Yeah? Uh -oh. So let me give you an idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, I'll do it with either hand. The headline says, and I'm trying to read it, Faster than a speeding dash, dash, dash. That was faster than a speeding bull, bullet. They got a blur, which I knew they were going to get the blur. But, you know, it, like I said, I'm a fast. Or the Army. I come out of the Army. One of my early black belts, Tony Calabro. The two of us were always in mischief together. Nothing serious, but when you get out of the Army, you have one pair of dress uniform and you have two pairs of fatigues so I come up with one of my schemes we're going to go to Fort Dix we'll drive on in fatigues I'm no longer in the military but I still have the uniforms so I know you go through the, the gate the guard gate in those days it was loose there wasn't terrorists and taxes stuff like that I even have security now if I go to make deal or a clearance thing I just show it I'm good to go. Anybody in the call is good to go, unless it's a red alert. Then they have to show ID that they're with me. 
So we get through. Now here's what we were gonna do. Fort Dix has PXs, which we would know as super, uh, supermarkets, lots of them. And you're allowed to buy cigarettes untaxed, four cartons per person. So me and Tony would go in uniform, and that would be eight cartons per PX, and we'd go sometimes go get eight, eight cartons for each, you know, get on a different line and this and that. We kept going to PX to PX, and we had about 220, 250 cartons in the trunk. And I told Tony, I had him in my basement in Brooklyn, and I'm rehearsing him and rehearsing him. Tony walked with the typical Brooklyn bop. And I'm not embellishing. He was the Brooklyn bop personified. And I told him, if we run into an officer, I'll yell, Tange, what? And I rehearsed it. When he acknowledges, I salute down, you salute down, and we go, would you freeze? Okay, we practiced and practiced and practiced till he had it. We come walking out, one of the PXs, with our eight cartons going to the trunk of the car, waiting to go back into the PX again to load up more different lines, you know. And I look and I see in uniform a major. Now that's very rare. He's going into the PX with his wife or girlfriend, whatever. I see him and I snap to attention and go, Page, hey, hey. Tony Calabro goes, after all the rehearsing, all the practicing, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? That major looked at his girlfriend or wife like, like, I'm not even going to bother with these guys. He was having a nice day. He didn't want to ruin his day, but I couldn't believe it. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say after practice? You're rehearsing. Oh, my God. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. But a lot of funny things did happen. Funny talking about them now. Famous and the infamous. I've met a lot of people. Some famous and some infamous. Actors, movie stars, Mr. Universes, Mr. Americas, sports figures, and we were friends. For example, I had the gym in, in the spa, health spa in Jersey, which was a big operation, a swimming pool and dual facilities, ladies' side, men's side. Up on the roof, we had a solarium for sunbraid, bathing, you know. And to give me publicity, I would uh, ask like Barry Newman, uh, Barry, when you're in New York, because he has a co-op in New York, he still does, but he's all the time now in Beverly Hills. And I said, when you're in New York, let me know. I'd like to have you come out. I'll send a limo to pick you up, bring you out, because I'll notify the local press, and you get me some free advertisements, free press. There's a story on the wall there, Barry Newman and I, who we showing up. So he came out to see me. I had a radio, a TV show on cable called The World of Fitness and Karate, and I was the host, and it was filmed in a studio, and then we put it up on the cable. It was a way of marketing without advertising. You know, people would look for it, because I had different people come. Matter of fact, a funny story, but Yoel Judah, who was probably one of the greatest kickboxers of all time, uh, his son, Zab Judah, became a world boxing champ for years. And Jamaican guy, real nice people, mother, father. And uh, they were bringing Emmanuel Lewis. Remember Webster, the little black guy with the green shirt and the suspenders? Well, so they brought him. I sent the limo to Brownsville. I sent the driver out. Now, a limo in Brownsville is like an eyesore. That's the ghetto. And they had, he had to go in the back and knock on the door. That was all barricaded, and they all came out through that. You know, I don't know what was down there. Maybe I don't know. But anyway, they came, but they're not. Uh, they came to the place. Media press came. You, I can see here. Uh, Webster came to see me at all. The Judah, etc. His, his mother, Webster's mother, came to. And uh, after that, we went to the studio to film the. Uh, the show, World Fitness and Corrupting. And we're talking about Zab Judah. He's going to, uh, 
That's it. Your well is going to fight. I'm going to put a big kickboxing event up for publicity and marketing, you know. And uh, Emmanuel Lewis was there, and he's cute as hell. He's a real nice kid. And uh, we're all there, and I says, well, we're all looking forward to seeing our boy in the ring. Our boy. It didn't do it, not me. But they all knew me. There was no malice, and it was just a way of talking. Instead of saying our guy, I said, oh, boy, you know. And it became funny. We all laughed about it later over of dinner. And that's another thing. We went to my mother's house, and the limo pulls up on the Jersey Shore in Bricktown, New Jersey. The limos just aren't something you see there unless it's a funeral. And some kids must have noticed Emmanuel Lewis getting out of the limo because he stood out just like he's on TV, that same outfit. And the word spread in the neighborhood. Well, by the time we were ready to leave, we had a circle of people around the house, kids taking pictures and all. They didn't have cell phone cameras in those days, you know, mothers taking pictures, and they, it was cute. I, my friends have been good to me. They've been good to me. Uh, oh, the infamous. When I was in Queens, I lived in Queens, and there was an old guy that I was introduced to, who was a legend in the underworld. His name was Michael Miranda, Big Mike. When he passed away, the headline said, Michael Miranda, the old god of the mafia. He had a mansion on Greenway North in Forest Hills. And I became a friend of two of his very close associates. And I met Mike, and then eventually Mike took a liking to me. Yeah, you know I looked up to him. You know, the guy was a powerhouse and a class guy. He didn't, they don't act like tough guys. Big shots don't try to act like big shots. They're nice. And eventually it got to the point where if Anthony, he had one son, Anthony. Anthony's a couple of years older than me. If Anthony had to go to the airport or something, he would say, ask Billy. He didn't say, I told Billy to ask if Billy's available to take Anthony at the airport. Of course, I always was. I was very honored. That's his most precious cargo that he trusts me with his son. And Auntie and I became friends, and uh, Mike became uh, very close. I became very close to him. He had no young people around him. I was very flattered. Very flattered. Uh, one time, one of my early on pawn this, Fritzy passed away a couple of years ago, I said to say, Fritz and Giovanelli was a captain with the Genovese. Uh, I walk into his restaurant, Ciro's, and this Nick the Ballet, the captain with the bananas. I walk in, hey, Nick, and I look, oh, shit, the old man is here. I said, let me go pay my respects. I'll be right back. And uh, as I'm walking over, I see Tommy, t two Tommies, Tommy Cousin, Tommy uh, uh, Carmelli. I see Tommy Cabelli lean over and say, Billy just came in, and I said, your old man smiles, shake his head. And then the other time, Billy just came in, the old man smiles, and I went over Tommy, Tommy, Mr. Miranda. Mr. Miranda stood up to shake my hand. And that's, that's clear. Sorry, that's, you didn't have to do that. Stood up to shake my hand. It was very flattering, and anybody that noticed, and people would know who he is, especially in that neighborhood. People think of Brooklyn, they think of tenement houses. It was a big hall. We even had an extra lot on the side at the it was grandma and grandpa's before my mother father's. And we had gates, so I would pull up. We didn't have power gates. You get out, you open the gate up, you drive your car in, you shut the gate. And I would notice once in a while, depending how the timing was, and I was in and out all the time, this old man, sharp dressed, would walk down. It was a one way street going towards 86th Street. And he would stop. He would look down the street, and then he'd look the other way. I'd say, this guy's looking to see if he's being followed. So I kind of helped out. I looked, and I double-checked him, and he saw me looking, and he looked at me, and I nodded my head. I didn't know who the old man was. And then one day, after this occurred maybe three or four times, the guy not directly across the street, catty corner across the street, that I know, comes out, he's walking across the street towards me. He says, Bill, do you know Fonz Webb? I says, no, I know all of them. He was my Miranda's choice for boss when Mike passed away. So well, he knows you. What do you mean? He says, my cousin is 
Johnny LaRock. And he meets him over here at the house, and he's noticed you a few times watching for him. So he came in a while ago, and he says, who's that guy across the street? And I looked out, I said, that's Billy. And he said, oh, that's Billy. He knew me, but there was a reason he knew me. Because of Mike and thing is uh, the list I was on. But uh, a very interesting thing happened. I was hanging out with a guy from the Colombo crew. Because we hang out with each other. I had an after hour club. This guy used to come around. We were hanging out together. And we were working on something. And he had to go down and get an okay before he could do it. Well, we went downtown that day. He drove a big Lincoln Town car, and it was a lot of traffic downtown Brooklyn. So he said, we wait in the car. I'll leave you double parked. He, I'll be right down. He runs up. He comes down. He's had to go. He says, good, we're on. Okay. Well, me and another guy like to do the job. Now, when I planned something, I was good. The other guy planned it for me. So, so I hope this guy, the guy was good if he gave me something to do. But I planned it. I don't know how good he was as a planner. I got there, it didn't like the way it was going. We got spotted. The deal was screwed up. I go meet the guy at his house. His wife and kids are downstairs. We're up on the third floor. I'm double parked. The guy tried to kill me at his house. He was bringing me coffee and I spot him to own me. I flocked it in time. I had a little powder barn that pushed my way out. And I walked downstairs, and his wife and the kid were just sitting on the couch. And uh, I just walked past them. Well, about a week, I stayed away from the guy. I knew there was a problem. I'm not stupid. Guy tries once. He doesn't know where he's gone. I see the old man walking. And this time, he's not looking behind him. He's looking. He's looking for me. The old man finds a while. And he said, Bill, he said, I walked across the street. Bill, he says, uh, did you know that that place was under my protection? He says, no. Come on, I, I never would have done anything like that if I knew that. Yeah, I idolized you guys. I says, I went downtown. We double parked. He went up to see, I won't mention, he passed away. He went to see Andrew. He told me he was okay. He said, that's just what I thought. Do you have a place where you can get out of town for a week or so if you need? I says, yeah, my uncle's on the Jersey Shore. Says, okay. Go give Joey the phone number and do not come home until he calls you. It's okay. And don't worry about it. Well, I did. My mother called. Her brother, my uncle, called. He says, because the house was, the summer hall was empty, unless they were there a weekend sometimes. I went down, and finally one day the phone rang. Joey says, come on, hold. No one's seen that guy for a few days. Him and his car had never been found. So I had people that cared about me. Cared about me. But, uh, Funds a well. Yeah. Oh, and then Frank Costello. It's a funny story. Frank Costello, when I was learning the health club business in Manhattan at the Shelton Health Club for Women, that was the entire 16th floor of the hotel. The men's health club was in the basement, because that's where the pool was. Mr. Costello loved the steam rooms. He used to get up early in the morning, meet people for coffee in the Waldorf, or Rubens Restaurant, which was open 24 hours a day. That was a famous place. That's where the Rubens Sandwich came from. 24-7. It was around the corner from the Cobra Cabana. And he'd go to the Waldorf, meet people, wherever. And then he'd come and use the steam beds. Well, there was a pimp that lived in the building. He was a black guy, and he stood out like a sore thumb in the building in that hotel. Not in the Waldorf, in the shelter. So one day I'm by the Newspaper stand down in the lobby near the elevator, and he calls me, he's built. Interested in a watch? So, what do you got? And he shows me. Lucha Picard, white 
gold, 52 diamonds in the bezel. It was a knockout. So what do you want for it? A Greg. It's okay, I'll take it. It's tomorrow morning, I'll be back. No, 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 it's first come, first serve. Come on, I'll have $1,000 on me. I don't walk around with that kind of money, I'm working. First come, first serve, you know where I am. I come downstairs a little later, and I'm thinking, how the hell not? I, I, they didn't have uh, debit cards and stuff in those days. I banked where I lived in Queens at the time. So who comes walking in, comes over by the magazine thing? Mr. Costello. It's Mr. Costello. Can I speak to you a second? You should show up. I says, you know, there's a black pimp that lives in the building. Yeah, I see it right here. He's got a watch for sale, a Luchin Bacard, I call him white gold, 52 diamonds and a bezel, lots of grand freak. And I told him, I'll take it, I'll see you tomorrow morning. He said, no, first come, first serve. I don't have it, I don't bank you. Anyway, possibly, maybe, if you have it on you, I'll bring it to you tomorrow night. He said, meet me downstairs by the locker. Five minutes later, I go downstairs by the locker, and he's getting undressed, and I walk over, and he hands me plenty. I said, oh, thanks very much. I take the money, I put it in my pocket. I go upstairs. I count it. He gave me 11 $100 bills. I said, oh, shit, he overpaid me 100 bucks. So quick, I went back down. He was still by the locker. And I'm walking over, and he spots me, and I see him smile. He's trying to hold back a smile, but he's smiling. So said, what are you smiling? So I walk over, to Mr. Costello. When I got upstairs, I counted the money. You gave me $1,100 bills. You overpaid me. And he smiles at me. He says, Bill, I do that intentionally. I learned the quality of a man for $100. Do you know how many friends of mine never brought that 100 back? He was. I was so proud of myself. What a lesson that was. He was testing me for me all the bucks. He was a very wealthy guy. You know, so, um, like I said, I've met a lot of people famous and in infamous and uh, you learn a lot because there's so many things that you encounter in life different situations and you learn remember the expression a wise man can learn from a fool and you'd be shocked that you can pick up and learn from different people this guy and that guy everybody has a little something that they can share with you to make you sharper and a, a little better whatever you gotta do Oh, there was something else that I enjoyed, though. There was an intelligence program at USF, University of South Florida, here in Tampa. And I had a, a five-year arrangement with them to lecture at the intelligence program. And I brought in a lot of prestigious people from the CIA, former director of clandestine operations, Mike Guinness, other guest speakers, that were really interesting. Matter of fact, we, when I brought Mike Ennis in, we had the biggest audience we ever had because I was a vice president with AFIO, Association for Former Intelligence Officers. Even though I wasn't an intelligence officer, I was just a test asset, but they wanted me at that position like I voted in, and it, I enjoyed that. But when I elected a USF, uh, it went over pretty big. I gave some seminars, and the people enjoyed it. I would take people out of the audience and explain, show different things that they were learning and didn't even realize they were learning. It's very interesting through reflexes and things like that. And I got a lot of compliments for that. It was a nice payday, 450 bucks. I go to for an hour and a half. It was only once a month. When the program ended in five years, it was a federal grant. And I worked with a lot of uh, recruiters. Uh, the CIA likes to recruit out of the colleges. Uh, of course, sometimes we draw big audiences, sometimes protesters, usually, but security removes them. But um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed it. Uh, one of them that was recently retired, he works back with a contract now, so I can't use his last name. I'll just call him Fernando. Uh, he even knew my ex. He said, Bill, I didn't know. He did some checking on me. He said, I didn't know what Ann was your, your ex. I said, yeah. Yeah. 
We says, oh, she was a good officer. She, she was good. She was pretty decorated. I made a movie, and she's in it with a bunch of other people. I'll get into that in a second. And you'll even see all the awards on the war. Uh, exceptional performance awards from the agency, etc. Uh, they're not even allowed to bring them home when they're active. They're in the safe that they have for Langley. And we had that, that safe in the, uh, in the condo. It's in the movie. We use it for something funny. Uh, yeah, that was my first movie. I enjoyed doing that. The name of the movie is The Last Score. It's all you need to. Hey, hey, how you doing? Great to see you. Looking great. Hey, Doug, look who's here. Great to see you. Looking good. Had a lot of compliments. A lot of people enjoyed it. Nobody getting shot. Nobody getting blown up. What do you need, Bill? I want to make one more score before I fade into the sunset. Just a score by an old timer who wants to make some big money in his old age so he could go out in style and there's a lot of humor in it too. There's a lot of funny stuff in it. And then that's it. Um, instructional videos, I did a bunch of the Karate Kid Training Video 1, the Karate Kid Training Video 2, Can you remember some of the names of them? What was the video you made about like the world of karate or uh, the lifetime of karate? I, what I did is I blended in about that's had thousands of hits. I blended in the first one, and uh, I blended in three or four and put it together, and so it become one great big long one. People that really have an interest in karate, there's a lot in there, a lot of stuff. And the techniques you explained and showed, and the book I the cutters, and it's not your normal. I always say this to try to act humble. It's not your normal karate, it's not a game. Karate is ugly if used. And I. I use that a lot when I'm teaching. It's it's not a sport. It's to protect you and a loved one, keep you out of harm's way. Bill, is there anything funny you'd like to share with us? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, we all need to lay off Dollar Eddie. Like I said, you can't make this stuff up. On Sundays, Mom and Dad and my sister and I, we always went to Grandma's house. Grandpa and grandpa's and brother. Well, this one Sunday, I had a plan. I had a girlfriend, Sheila, that lived in Flushing. That's part of Queens. So I told her, listen, my mom and father are going to go to Brooklyn. I'll tell them I'm going to stay home. And we'll go to my house. And I, I take her, pick, I take my mom and father's car, and they said, be sure you're back. I'm going to grandma's. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll be back. I take her and I drop her off around the corner of Jamaica Avenue to Schmidt's Ice Cream Hall. I should stay here, have an ice cream soda. I'll be back for you soon as they leave. My mother father knew which kid's up to something. Now, that house on one side was Mr. Schmidt and our driveway. On the other side, the house was an office for a famous surgeon named Dr. Emil Zola. And he lived in Oyster Bay. And that house was his father's years ago, and he used that house as his office. So it was empty all weekends. So, Mom and Dad leave, and I go out on the porch, which was all enclosed and everything, looking through the blinds. Sure enough, Oh, they left my sister. Oh, they said, oh, we're leaving Violet Hall. I said, oh, I'm not. It was a big house, but her, her room was across the hall from me. They said, all right. Nothing I can do about it. She's already over there. They're leaving. They go, and i looking out the window, peeping through the side of the blind, and I see they went around the block trying to see what if I had anything planned. I think, you know, they knew something was up. They know me. So I wait, wait, five minutes later. They circle again. 
Just look at this. They must have been parked down a block waiting to see what was going on. That was a one-way street, too, going up towards Forest Park. I wait a third time. They circled. I said, Glenn. Finally, I said, I think it's clear. I waited a lot of time this time. I go to Schmidt's Ice Cream Parlor. I get Sheila. We come walking. We get to the house. And I says, now, keep quiet because my sister's upstairs. So okay. I open the door, and my little dog, Ginger, comes running at us. I don't know that Sheila's frightened of dogs, and she tries to scream, and I'm holding her mouth. Don't worry. Hold her by the mouth. Get in, shut the door. I get the dog. She calm it down. Just follow me. I take her to the steps. We go upstairs gently, quietly. No, whenever you try to be quiet, it's noisier. Get into my room, and I shut the door, and I said, I'll go downstairs, make her some cocktails. I'll be right back. I go downstairs. I get the tray. I get the cocktails. I put the ice cubes in it, and I'm gently coming up the stairs. Well, of course, ching, 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 ching. The ice cubes make noise. I get in the room, and we make a toast. We have them sip. It's just, oh, I have to use the bathroom. So, uh, the bathroom's down the end of the hall. I said, be quiet. I'll walk you over. And then I'll wait outside. My sister's in there. We walk over. I make the turn to the bathroom. I hear my sister's door open. I quick shut the door. My sister's knocking the door. Billy, I have to use the bathroom. All right, father, my stomach's bothering me. I don't feel good. You can be, you can be tired. Come on. And she's waiting and waiting. I can't open the door. I get a girl in there. Finally, my sister says, I'm going to call mommy. That means she had to go downstairs to get the phone. Quick, I get Sheila back in the room. She's in the bathroom. I get back in the room, shut the door. Well, mom and dad decided to come home early. Sheila's in the room. I go downstairs, and I told Sheila, keep quiet, I shut the door. And I'm talking about how oh, my father, I don't know where he went, and my mother was doing something in the kitchen, and I go down in the basement. And we had down there a big rope, not the kind of clothesline rope, it was kind of a nautical rope, it was thick. So I wrap it around my waist, I pull the shirt gel out, and I bring it upstairs. In those days, we had radiators for heat. So I take the rope out, and I hook it to the radiator for support. And I tell her, she says, what's the, what are you going to do? She says, I got to let you, I got to get you out. What do you mean? Don't worry, it's on one flight up. I put a thing around her like a, a loop, like a, I forget what kind of knot that is. And here I am, lowering her out the window. Anchored to the radiator, God forbid it slips or anything. She got down, she un unloosened it, I pulled it up, I closed the window, I told Mom, Dad, I'm going to borrow the car, I'll see you later. And I went and picked her up over at Schmidt's Ice Cream Parlor and took her home. But that was, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I was telling my friends in Naples that story, and their kids were hysterical. You lowered her out the window? I said, yeah, it was only one flight, and they were laughing like hell. Oh, uh, there's one other thing you might want to, I'd like to mention. My first wife, Carol, uh, she had big money. She was wealthy, and she had a $2 million home in New Canaan, Connecticut. We even had the wedding there. I was married in Connecticut, and Kid Carl Gambino was my best man. He has the same name, even looks like the old man. He's one of his nephews. And, uh... This is interesting because the house was a big home on four acres. It was about two doors from two homes from David Letterman's in our home humbled his. That's when he lived in New Canaan, Connecticut, and that woman could break it into his house or something like that, a fan or an obsessed man. And in the bedroom, there was the big wall where we had the TV facing the bed, and on the right and left side, the wall was triple sliding glass doors ceiling to floor. 
And when it was a chilly night out, what we'd do is open sliding glass door, just leave the screen open, maybe 10 inches, and then set the alarm so that nobody can move it. If it does, it triggers the alarm, and we'd get them, get them to the blankets, cuddle up, and get the nice fresh air. I wake up one morning to the sound of a bird screaming, I said, man, what the hell is that? I'm waiting. I said, oh, shit, this went on for 10 minutes, 15. I says, I can't take it no more. I get up, she's sound asleep. I go over, huh? I look out, and here's this big monstrous bird up there chirping away. So I said, all right. I turn the alarm off. I slide the sliding glass door. I slide the screen door over. I go under the bed. I take out the shotgun. I see a bird. Boom! She catapults right out of bed like a cartoon. Two feet landed on the floor. Knees bent with her eyes and mouth open like, What was that? Well, I could you imagine waking up to a shotgun blast in your bedroom and the smell of gunpowder? Oh, my God. Thinking about it, it's pretty... You should have seen the look on her face. Eyes open like that. If you think about it, who would want to wake up to a shotgun blast in their bedroom? So I just wanted to share that. I'd like to go back to my military and the special project that I worked on for the company. When I took it, they promised me an early discharge. Well, I got finished in about seven months, to their satisfaction, and as they promised, early just discharge was coming, and they went out of their way to get me so I could leave on the 23rd of December and be home for Christmas Eve, which was really nice. And I remember it, it takes two weeks to get discharged from the military, all the different spots you have to stop at and wait online, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's quite a process. But in order to make the time frame, they had me hand-delivered. Now, when you're hand-delivered, that means you have a driver that takes you stop to stop and walks in with you. You go to ahead of any lines. It's quite a privilege. And I was discharged out of there in two days. A strange thing happened. As I'm walking out, totally complete, done. I hear a voice say, Hey, Billy! And I looked over, and it was Peter Russell. Peter Russell is an old friend of mine from the neighborhood. A kid I grew up with, played ball with, lived around the corner from me. And we went over, exchanged greetings. He says, Pete, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to be a, helicom a helicopter pilot. I'm going over to Vietnam to serve as a helicopter pilot like my father. I saw Pete, good luck to you, man. Stay safe. I look forward to seeing you home. And I told him, I'm on my way out. I'm discharged as of right now. Paperwork is right on my head. Well, little did I know, but I'd probably be the last guy from the neighborhood to see him alive. He was killed in action. His helicopter was shot down. And he's MIA. And it was uh, very sad. Uh, it was horribly. It's tough enough to hear statistics and hear about losses, but when they're people that you know personally, that you have history with, grew up together, it's a lot sadder and a lot worse. Uh, something else that happened that I had mentioned earlier that I was playing about a lawsuit and just so happens that this guy that thought he was Charlie Chan and applied for uh, the Release of Information Act to get information on me. Well, when he got it, of course, the attorney had it, the defense attorney, the insurance company attorney. And he started asking me about it. Now, in there, the details in the box said unavailable. Of course, they were classified, but 
they couldn't figure that out because they never conf were confronted with a situation like this before. Special project. And it has on there days that I was paid by the Army, not days that I was in the Army, because that special project was not considered part of the Army. And the discharge was congressionally ordered. Now, here's the important part. When I was being depositioned by the insurance company of Tidy, it was a big firm, an expert in his field. I didn't like the guy, but I have to compliment him. He was good at what he did. He asked me if I ever worked for the VA. As soon as he said that, red flag went off. And, of course, everything's being recorded, and I said to him, let me tell you something, counselor. You might be a big shot in the insurance company, and you might be a great lawyer. And I'm not saying that because I want to compliment you. But your mole in the VA just did you some favor. That's why you asked me if I ever worked for the VA. Because my records are marked case sensitive. Anybody that has to get into them, they ask who you are and what do you want. His name would have been on there. He would have been fired, probably rolled over on you, and you wouldn't be practicing law anymore. Between breaking into case-sensitive medical records and not being a, uh, a treating physician, you'd be in serious problems. Forget about the HIPAA law. But there's something else you didn't know, and he didn't know. They're also congressionally flagged. So you should be real lucky that he didn't get into them. So I just wanted to bring that little bit up to the issue uh, to update every little thing that I could possibly remember. And I'm shooting from the hip. I'm not reading. So wanted to bring that to your attention. Oh, if regarding different things that I worked on while I owned health clubs and while I owned karate schools, I owned that trademark for the Karate Kid training videos and the Karate Kid training centers. And I did make a bunch of instructional videos. The uh, self-defense to the max, the legal weapon, and the Karate Kid training videos volume one and two, which later we put together into one called A Lifetime of Karate, which has had thousands of hits. I also did a documentary movie, Great Karate Inspirations. And these things are all available on YouTube if you wish to watch them. Bill, is there anything humorous that might come to your mind about something that happened that you want to let us all in on? Mm -hmm. I did share a few things with you, but... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think, you'll, I think the viewers will enjoy this. I was visiting some friends down in Naples, and they had another friend that his wife all on. And this guy's name was Johnny T. He was a singer, doo-wop singer, and... He entertained at different clubs and nice restaurants in the area. And he knows I was from the Tampa area. And he says, I'm going to be up Tampa uh, next week, Friday, Saturday night. I says, uh, what's going on? He's all oh, the Hard Rock Casino is having a special event uh, it's for invited guests only. High rollers from the casino and some of the entertainers. Uh, Paul Ike is going to be the guest. So, oh, man, all right, I'll come by and see you. He said, no, Bill, it's for inviting guests on and you can't get in. I says, I can get in. How can you get in? It's inviting guests on. Don't worry about it. I'll see you there. So I'm, I used to belong to the Tampa Bay Society Club, which had the top floor, I think it was the 45th floor of the Bank of America building. Had a panoramic view of Tampa Bay. It was quite a nice place. And this friend of mine, Mike Fagan, used to go there. I was telling him, I said, Mike, Paul Ank is going to be around the corner at this, I don't know what you, not a convention center, but some big hotel that had a, a meeting room there. And he saw, I know that place. I grew up over there. I know every street, park, a spot, and everything. I know how to get in without even paying and park without paying. I said, all right, come on, you want to call me? Yeah, well, you sure can get it? I'm like, we're going to go over. We dress nice, suits, etc. I'm going to walk in. Just follow me. 
Don't look around. Don't pay attention to nobody. I'm going to walk in like I own the place. And you just follow me. Don't even look at security. Nothing. Okay. We go in. He shows me how to get in the side entrance, how to do this, and we're walking up. We're in the hallway, going towards the entrance for this, this room that was for this event. And I see security in front of the door and all. And I walk right by them. They don't say a word to me. They didn't ask me for tickets, ask me who are nothing. I walk in. I push the door open. The room is black, and all of a sudden, a spotlight hits me. So I froze. He's right behind me. And I look to my left. And who's standing there? Paul Ica. They must have said, Paul Ike is coming, he's coming now. And they darkened the room. They had everything ready to give him the spotlight. And I walked in and got his spotlight. It was a Kodak moment. I looked over at him and I said, I guess that was for you. And he even smiled and laughed. It was, it was a funny scene. It was a funny scene. And then I walked, I saw Johnny T in the back. And I walked over and I said hello to him, sat down at a table, me and Mike. And he's looking at me in disbelief like, I can't believe what he just did. Not only did you get in, but you took Paul Ike's spotlight. So I, I thought it was pretty funny. There's also another one. When I was young and I was running around the hot spots in Manhattan, like Danny's Hideaway and uh, some of the upscale places, I used to dress nice. I was kind of dapper in those days. And, of course, I was slender. And I was good looking for my age a little bit. Anyway, uh, I traveled in the right circles, and I met a woman. Yeah, her name was Barbara. And we were dating. And I knew, because people told me she's the ex-wife of Prince Ali Khan, who was a very flamboyant, famous playboy, Prince Ali Khan. And it's not like the old days before terrorism, before people people didn't like Arabs after that. But in those days, he was a colorful character, good-looking guy. He was sharp and a real playboy. Had lots of wives. So one day, I'm up her condo, like normal. You wait for the woman. I'm sitting at the couch. And I'm waiting for her. She's getting dressed. And I look to the side of the couch, and there's a magazine rack. And I see the old-fashioned uh, photo album with the binder. So I take it out. I'm looking through it. Now, I had been bragging to my friends. Yeah, I'm dating one of uh, Prince Ali Khan's ex-wives and this and that. So so my good friends knew about it. And I'm looking through the album, and there's a newspaper clipping. And here's her picture. And it said, Former wife of Prince Ali Khan, Barbara Moskowitz. Well, when I told my friends her real name was Moskowitz, that's it. They busted my balls forever. Till today, sometimes some of them call me, Hey, Moskowitz. And I know who, exactly who they are because only a few people knew that. But it was a, it was a funny moment. I wanted to share it with you. Thanks for asking is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, it's not over yet. Protect yourself the way you can. Your defense is a lethal hand. You stand strong and proud and brave. For it's your life that you may save.